Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to present a no hype guide to open source. And we'll talk about some of the things that were discovered during uh, a couple of surveys. And in fact, I validated this data with two other surveys. Uh, the one I am using primarily is one from Perforce. And it was in, it's an open logic Perforce and uh, I believe it was the open source initiative that put this together. It was to look at how open source was being used in 2022. So let's, let's talk about it. So I want to talk about this quote from Eric Allman. He was the founder of SendMail. He said, the intellectual property situation is bad and getting worse. To be a programmer, it requires that you understand as much law as you do technology. I'm telling you, with all of the open source licensing that's going on, absolutely you do. Or at least you need to have somebody with you that does. How many applications are there in the world? So this, is a, this source is straight from Apple, 2 million. And that's what's in their app store. So for apps for the Mac OS, 2 million. For Android, 2.5 million. And that's the apps in their Play Store. So there's probably more than that, I know. But I have to go somewhere where they tell me how much, how many apps they have. iOS and their, play, and their store has 3.7 applications and then 1 million applications, which are games. So a total of 4.7 million. Windows has 35 million. Now, in their app store, they only have about 700,000. And I'm wondering of that 35 million, how many of those go all the way back to the beginning of Windows and are pretty much obsolete? Because that seems like an awfully large number. But what about open source? Who's the kingpin here? Well, open source is 54 million open source projects as of... Uh, as of the end of 2021, and it's still growing. This is reported by GitHub. I think they do it, uh, every, it yeah, they do it every year. So the survey that uh, the Open Logic folks did, they said, hey, what, what, are the, what are some of the reservations that you guys have when you're looking to put open source up uh, it, to solve issues in your organizations? And very first one, skills. And they didn't feel like they had the skills to be able to manage open source projects. And they weren't sure what the heck they were going to do about it because, uh, yeah, they, well, today management doesn't want to pay to have people trained. And, and the documentation isn't so great with some of the open source projects. Now, some of them they are, and some of them, yeah, they're not so great. What about some of the others? So license restrictions, and that, of course, depends upon what open source license you you have in your particular project that you've downloaded that you want to use. So, yeah, those can vary quite a bit. Some of them, for example, allow you to connect uh, closed source software or proprietary software to open source, and some of them do not. So you have to be careful what you're doing. And then, of course, the GPL license, if, you're, if you encountered that, you're going to have to give back. If you make any changes to that open source code, you have to give it back to the library that you got it from because that's part of the contributions that that's your payment for using the open source software. There's other reservations like they don't feel like it scales as well as closed source software. And why? So why are they doing it? Why are they going after the open source software? And the main reason is it gives them access to innovations and new technologies. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I can understand that. I mean, it's far easier for the open source community to innovate something new. And a lot of times you'll find that it's mainly just it's a developer that's encountered some kind of problem and or some feature that they need in order to do their job. The other one was programming languages. And again, I'm doing one of these. We're definitely going to talk about that one, too. Uh, and then database and database technologies. So, wow. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk about that, aren't we? That they're, yeah, and then finally operating systems. So, 
I think it kind of, maybe you catch in the same idea here that I did, but yeah, interesting. So who's getting this? Well, obviously it's for IT, it's for information technology. So I guess that's a big worry for me. I just don't quite understand. Uh, I don't. I mean, I get it sorta, but I don't get it sorta. So the skills thing, I think that's a disconnect uh, because you know the you're you're not gonna if if you do find somebody that has skills in the open source project that you're trying to use, chances are it's probably the developer that wrote it. Uh, and you're probably not going to have a lot of success attracting them away from whatever they're doing into your organization to work with your folks. You might consider in a software, an open source evaluation lab where you can stand things up, uh, go through things, do a hypothetical install for a use case that you have from one of your end users and see if, if you as a group can make the software do what you expect it to. Or you, maybe you start evaluating the open source software to see which has a better fit for the types of use cases you're trying to solve. Because without that, you're spinning your wheels, right? And I think they know that. I, th I think they know, they're frustrated. I can, I can see from the answers in some of the questionnaires. And I will put a link to the survey so you can look through it yourself. It, I didn't want to put it in here because obviously that's that's copyrighted material, and I don't I don't particularly want the strike. So I will refer you to them. You can read the the uh, the different uh, the different answers that you got there. But I was I would start with that. That'd be my suggestion, and maybe you guys have others too. Put them in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you guys think as well. So the other one is license uh, licensing restrictions. Yeah, obviously you're going to have to go through a licensing review process and you can't just use the open source package at the top level because open source packages are made up of other open source packages. There's a whole software bill of materials underneath the, uh, the covers and you need to look at those and why. Yeah, licensing review definitely required. Scalability, this is why I was going like, what? Scalability is an architecture. It doesn't come with an open source software for free. It ha you have to, if it, the open source software project has to be designed for scalability. Now, what do we mean about by scalability? Well, as it turns out, there are three kinds. There is vertical scalability, which just means, okay, so I have an application, I stick it on here, my users are using it, but it doesn't perform well. So I look at it, I see that it needs more memory, so I add more memory to the box. That's vertical scaling. The, anything you can do inside of one machine to increase the performance, whether that be add processors, add memory, add network channels, add channels to the uh, disk, whatever, those, whatever the problem is with the performance, that's vertical scaling. The second type of scaling is horizontal scaling. We also call that, that is a form of distributed computing. So what, what do we mean by horizontal scaling? So it's basically the supercomputer model where you take a copy of what's on that one server and you replicate it to a bunch of servers, however you, many you need in order to be able to uh, run things in parallel. So as your workload comes in, you have something that is spraying that workload across there, or and then those those different boxes have to communicate with each other to tell each other that, hey, I did this work, here's the result, and then somebody is going to serve as the collector, right? Somebody is going to collect all that together and, yeah, and finish the processing job in, in, in uh, tandem. Again, Horizontal scaling doesn't come with open source software. That's something you have to do. Yeah, you can put Kubernetes on here, but that doesn't mean your application is still going to support horizontal scaling. The third type of scaling is cloud elasticity. Cloud elasticity is used to right size your workload. So it means that I add servers as my workload increases. So I am doing horizontal scaling. Uh, but in the, the difference is I don't leave it there at the at the largest piece because as the workload declines, I pare down, I close off those servers, I return it back at those uh, the servers that were 
work and I return those back to the uh, availability pool and that cuts my cost, right? Because I'm not using those servers, so I'm not going to get billed for it. Because on cloud, you get billed for what you use. So, and again, open source software <laughs> does not guarantee elasticity unless that software has been specifically designed for it. So the other thing I want to talk about is, is that one of the areas that they said they were doing, uh, they were adding open source software was in the realm of database uh, and data technology. So if you look at the results of the survey, you will find the two top answers for databases is MySQL and Postgres SQL. So those two are relational databases. Relational databases do not like to be scaled up horizontally. Now, yeah, you can leave me comments below. I am well aware that there are there are things called sharding that allows things to do uh, to do replicas and build out horizontal scaling. But on re relational databases, it is not elegant. It is not efficient. You know, as an architect, every time I would hear somebody start talking about horizontal scaling with a relational database, I would go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's consider what this thing is going to cost to be able to do that because you end up having to replicate portions of your database or you have to you have to tear apart your database and put some of it here, some of it here, some of it here. And then you have whenever you're doing a query or you're doing processing, you have to process that SQL all the way across and back, right? Because each one of them is going to collect a result and it's, somebody's got to compile it together. It is not easy to do, I'm telling you. There are some databases uh, that are NoSQL based. They too use sharding, but they are designed for this kind of workload. So yeah, the problem is with relational databases is that you end up at the table and at the record having to shard across the systems. That's too fine grained. The reason why NoSQL works better is because it's at the document level. So yeah, I mean, it's totally different and it's more efficient. So yeah, yeah a scalability in those instances get tricky. So the choice that they may be using for the database may be one of the reasons why it doesn't scale as well. So there are some general disconnects here. So one of the problem, one of the other things that I saw was, hey, you're solving IT problems because what are you what are you working on? Programming languages, databases, yeah, and and those kinds of things. You're not really spending any time on end user software. So what do we mean by that? Let me roll. Uh, let me roll a uh, a uh, a video done by Steve Jobs at MIT. He can explain it to you a lot better than I can. Be right back. There's a really interesting book that was written by a guy named uh, Paul Strassman. And Paul has one of the more interesting jobs on the planet. He's this chief information officer, CIO of a very large organization called the Pentagon. And uh, they really understand software there. I had a conversation with him not too long ago, and he said the, the lesson from the Gulf War was that the best, the best software will win the war. And so they're trying to do a lot of work in the software area. And, um, he wrote a book, though, before he got this job called The Business Value of Computers. And it's rather thick and it's not good bedtime reading, but you can plow through it and there's some incredible stuff in it. And one, he asked two questions in particular. Uh, one was he surveyed a bunch of companies uh, from not very successful all the way up through really successful. And there's somebody taking notes here. And, uh, <laughs> and he asked, he asked how much they spent on information technology as a percentage of revenues. And he got a very counterintuitive answer, right? You'd think that either the really successful companies would either spend more or less than the not successful companies, depending on your theory. But it was exactly the same. They all spent about 2% of revenues on information technology. And he found this curious, and so he asked another question. How do they spend their money? And he found out that the, uh, the really successful ones, or actually, let's start with the not so successful ones. Uh, as we, success increases uh, and dollars increase, he found out that the not so successful ones spent the majority of their money on management productivity 
And the more successful ones spent the majority of their money on operational productivity applications. Right? Now, this was not very pleasant for me to read because I spent the first 10 years of my life on management productivity, <laughs> uh, which was PCs. Right? PCs and Macs never attacked operational productivity. They just attacked management productivity. Why is that? Because you can't go down to your local computer store and buy an app that will help you do stock trading, or will help you uh, run a hospital, or will help you um, in whatever operational part of your business you want to automate. What did we learn from all of this? So as you see that from the Steve Jobs video, he was talking about you know, the successful companies are, are going after operational problems and trying to solve those. And the ones that are losers, the ones that are not doing so well, becoming unsuccessful are the ones that are trying to solve management issues. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video today. I am going to put some links in the description of the video to talk to, to you about. Here are some companies that if you want them to get involved to help you with skills training or being able to do support on open source software, that's a big issue. Uh, and there are others that work on licensing and licensing compliance. There's some that even do uh, security audits of open source software. They go, again, through the SBOM. And then there, here's one you probably haven't thought of yet because you probably haven't reached it, is what happens if you have mergers and acquisitions and those impact, like we just saw with IBM buying Red Hat, uh, what happens when those impact uh, open source projects like CentOS, for example, how that impacts your business. And so they'd also look at some of that to give you mechanisms to put into place that at least give you some kind of, hey, here's my backup plan in case this happens. This is where I'm going to go. So you aren't flailing around. I mean, that, that, that whole business with CentOS, it was executed within a month. I mean, they, you did not have much time in order to address those problems, unless you happen to be on version seven. And yeah, and of course you just postponed it a little bit, but yeah, it, yeah, anyway, that's all I had for now. Hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please like and subscribe and let me know what some of your ideas are. Uh, just put a comment down below. Love to hear it. Bye for now.